Welcome to the Strategic Treasurer Podcast, your source for interesting treasury news in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. When it comes to working capital management, there are two primary perspectives, balance sheet and income statement. Failing to properly optimize working capital can hinder an organization's ability to generate profit or it can create liquidity challenges. On this episode of the Treasury Update podcast, Craig Jeffrey, Managing Partner of Strategic Treasure, and Edie Polinato, Global Head of Working Capital Solutions of Kariba, discuss leading practices for corporate treasury to optimize working capital with an eye to both liquidity and profit. Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey with Strategic Treasure. Today's topic is supply chain finance, exploring leading practices for payables financing. I'm joined with Eddie Polinato, who's the Global Head of Working Capital Solutions at Kariba. Eddie, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Craig. Nice to, nice to be here with you and have a chat on these uh, very uh, interesting topics. Thanks, Eddie. I'm, I'm going to begin by just covering a few areas about uh, working capital, the need to optimize working capital and some of the techniques, just to set the stage, and then I'll start asking you a few questions on how to proceed with that from a a corporate perspective. So the idea of optimizing working capital, the capital you have tied up in receivables, payable, and inventory, there's a number of projects that organizations can use. receivables-oriented projects, uh, items that focus on optimizing inventory, and ones that focus on the payable side of things. There's different techniques for payables financing. I'm going to list some of them, and there's different views as to whether all of these are supply chain finance, but I'm just going to list a few of those for the listeners. So on the buyer-led approaches, where it might be more accounts payable-centric program, you have reverse factoring, dynamic discounting as a tool to support that. On the supplier-led approaches, these are accounts receivable-centric solutions. We have things like factoring, forfeiting, invoice discounting, and inventory financing. And there's other trade finance and bank-led approaches, and we won't get into all of those, but uh, some of those examples may be a historical practice of factoring, where the company that has a receivable sells that receivable, to a financing partner, and there's a discount uh, used uh, to uh, support uh, the extension of credit from the factoring entity or the uh, the entity that's uh, extending the credit and collecting the receivables, and there's rules that that surround that. There's all kinds of asset-backed security programs as well that uh, leverage the receivable uh, activity as well. Those represent some of the methods of supply chain financing. Leverage the cash conversion cycle or leveraging the cash conversion cycle to optimize what you have for working capital. Not not keeping too much in there, not keeping too little, supporting the sales of the organization and the balance sheet. With that, I wanted to begin, Eddie, by asking you a, a couple of questions. So what, what do you see as a great foundation or a, a starting point when you look at optimizing working capital? Uh, Greg, thanks for the, uh, for the question. Actually, uh, as you correctly mentioned, when we talk about working capital, uh, we have you know, three main areas you, uh, you mentioned. So the uh, inventory, the payables, and the receivables. But there may be also a fourth uh, you know, pillar, which could be the, the basis to, to start optimizing the working capital. And by that, I mean, uh, I mean the cash, because uh, uh, knowing uh, your cash position, having visibility on where your cash is, is, is uh, clearly uh, the first basic step that we should look at. Because if, if we start you know, working on uh, accelerating the, the collection and, and working on the DSO or you know, uh, uh, working on the DPO for the payables, uh, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, we're going to talk about this. But the first thing to, to optimize the use of, the, of your funds but to know where your cash is, which is not something that is always uh, always done by treasurers. So I would say definitely look at your cash, have uh, the, the, the best visibility you can have and uh, use it properly. That could be the first uh, great step to, uh, to put in place. I, I like that, Eddie, the idea of some of the definitions of working capital are 
current assets minus current liabilities for accounting purposes, sometimes for banking purposes. But what's better, accounts receivable or cash, sometimes that's not even considered in that particular formula because it has a different purpose. But all good treasurers know we use cash to deploy for inventory or receivables to support the sales of the organization, and we convert receivables into cash so that we're more liquid and flexible. Uh, definitely a difference there and a different purpose for managing that. So thank you for that that overview. I, I wanted to move to the objectives um, or the starting point. When I look at leading practices in supply chain finance, uh, you and I have had conversations about the difference between things like payables finance and dynamic discounting. Maybe you could get the audience up to speed on some of your views on some of the different objectives that organizations may have. Yeah, yeah, great point. Indeed, when we when we talk about payables optimization, it's, it's clear that the first thing treasurers, finance uh, departments should uh, have in mind is the objective of the company. Uh, with that, I mean that uh, some companies uh, may have the need to optimize the, uh, the working capital. Others may be more uh, you know, interested in uh, um, optimizing uh, the EBITDA. And, and, and that's sometimes two different things. And, and different techniques then can be, uh, can be used to reach these two objectives. And, and companies need to be very clear on, on what they mean on what they want to uh, what they want to achieve if, if we talk about uh, payables finance reverse factoring uh, it's clearly a technique a tool that aims at optimizing working capital because in that sense you uh, you work on your payables you uh, renegotiate the terms of uh, payments with your suppliers and and of course that means that you get more liquidity in your supply chain and you uh, you definitely uh, uh, optimize the working capital on the other side, uh, you may be in a completely different situation whereby you, you have liquidity and you're not so interested in uh, reducing your working capital, but more on you know, working on uh, uh, your cost of good sales, reducing your cost of good sales, and generating more, more EBITDA. And most of the time, you know, these two objectives, they, uh, they, they are very, very different. And uh, it, it is very important to understand what is the... Uh, a strategy of the uh, of the company, and of course that techniques then will uh, be deployed uh, to reach these uh, these objectives. So uh, dynamic discounting uh, aims at uh, reducing the uh, cost of goods sales, but obviously that has a negative impact on uh, on the working capital for the uh, for the company because uh, your company will. Uh, uh, make an early payment using your own funds. And on the other side, uh, optimizing the working capital by paying later has clearly um, a great impact on your, um, on your uh, working capital. Eddie, I like that the, the target of, of adjusting uh, your activities to improve working capital or generate cash or free cash flow really focuses on the balance sheet side of, of the activity if you're thinking of them in financial statement terms. The other side, the focusing on costs of goods sold and using tools like dynamic discounting, focus on the income statement side. And there's definitely an interplay, right? It's very easy to uh, be terrible to your balance sheet. That's good for your income statement, uh, but that can create certain issues and, and vice versa. So I like how you laid, laid those out in terms of where does an organization want to see value or most value, and then obviously it gets to the point where there's some balancing. Now, Eddie, building a solid business case seems to be a beginning point. What do you consider important in building this business case? Yeah, absolutely. I think whatever the objective is, uh, we talked about the working capital reduction or the reduction of uh, cost of goods sales and uh, increase of EBITDA, it, it is clear that it's important to quantitative assessment of the benefits and build a business case because at the end of the day, this is going to uh, involve many departments. It's it's certainly uh, you know a CFO slash CEO topic, uh, and so when you want to put in place such a program, you need to uh, you need to, to come with uh, you know a solid uh, business case with uh, with uh, with figures. So how how do we do that? I mean, it's 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 all about you know assessing uh, you know the spend of uh, of the company. And uh, going for a supplier demographic analysis because clearly we uh, we need to involve the suppliers because at the end of the day to accelerate the payment we need the uh, consensus of the uh, of the supplier um, 
and 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 for that uh, reason, uh, we need to have a, a very good understanding of the demography of the suppliers in terms of uh, you know their rating, in terms of their their uh, appetite to see their collections, uh, to see an acceleration of their of their collections. So first thing to do is clearly to go through uh, the list of the spend of the, of the buyer. Uh, and determine for each supplier uh, what is the category of the supplier in terms of rating, uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, credit risk. Is this uh, is this supplier uh, uh, an investment investment grade supplier? Is this a sub investment grade supplier? Because obviously this will change a lot in terms of uh, the cost of funding that the uh, supplier will be ready to, to accept when the program is put in uh, in place. Whatever, by the way, the program is uh, dynamic discounting or payables, finance, reverse factoring uh, through the uh, the use of a of a, of a third party uh, liquidity provider like 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 a bank. So first thing is really to uh, understand the, the demography of the uh, of the suppliers, and then uh, and then I think uh, it's it's about also categorizing the suppliers according to the, the, the type of, of payment terms extension that they will be uh, okay to uh, to accept. Because if you look look at the cash flow cash flow gain for the buyer. It can be achieved with a lot of different uh, ways in terms of a um, payment term extension. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go through, through some to illustrate these, these different types of, uh, of gains that, that can be uh, achieved. There are some basic things that, that can be done uh, when, you, when you look at the, um, at the suppliers and the way uh, the supplier is paid within the organization. So, for example... Because the first thing it's uh, uh, around uh, paying on time a supplier because in some organization that could be a little bit surprising but some suppliers are, are paid before the uh, uh, contractual payment term so that's what one basic thing so going through uh, going through the list of uh, suppliers the way they are paid uh, there are other things like you know uh, looking at the uh, parent uh, versus subsidiary standard uh, uh, cash flow again uh, what I mean here is that the same supplier for the organization may not be paid the same way if it's a subsidiary or if it's the parent company. So clearly uh, applying the longest term for the same commodity to uh, the supplier is, is, is clearly a way to optimize the, the payables for the, uh, for the buyer. And then there are other techniques uh, that we go and look through when we look at the spend analysis uh, of um, when we do the uh, the spend analysis of the buyer, like obviously uh, arbitrage between the cost of funding uh, of the supplier and the cost of funding of, of the buyer. And that's why it's important to uh, uh, categorize uh, you know, the supplier based on their uh, credit risk. So, so it's really a strong analysis that uh, has, to be, uh, has to be done. Uh, and then we have uh, obviously uh, uh, by the teams to, to go through uh, you know the spend uh, the spend analysis and uh, and at the end of the day we can really assess the uh, uh, total uh, potential cash flow gain for the uh, buyer and have a granularity of uh, you know this um, gain knowing uh, for each supplier how much uh, uh, we can uh, we can save yeah so Eddie so one of the first things that you mentioned in this in this section had to do with uh, building the business case, and a couple things stood out to me. One, you mentioned uh, there's a lot of departments involved, and that's why it's so important, and that's why it's a, a treasure CFO item because it involves so many areas. Um, that stuck out, and then the second thing, segmenting uh, suppliers, for example, the demographics. Um, what the, what's the situation? How can you make a change there? Um, are those the two? key elements of that section or is there is there something else that that you would also emphasize it it's clear that then once uh, you have defined the uh, uh the business case you have uh defined how much cash flow you can uh, uh generate uh by introducing a dynamic reverse factoring tables finance uh within your organization uh, you you definitely also need to um, to align uh, the different stakeholders in the company because at the end of the day it's it's a finance project because it's about optimizing uh, the cash flow generating more uh, free cash flow but the relationship with the suppliers is handled by the, by the procurement so uh, and, and procurement need to see the benefits of uh, putting in place those those 
programs uh, because they have different objectives. So aligning procurement and finance is key. Training procurement on, on you know, the message uh, that needs to be sent to these suppliers is, uh, is obviously very important because they will have to, to handle this uh, uh, relationship. And, uh, and then onboarding the suppliers. So really, uh, you know, making sure that they get the value and that they, uh, and that they register to the, uh, to the program. Uh, assessing the benefits by uh, building the business case is, uh, is the first step, but then uh, executing the business case is, uh, is also obviously uh, very, very important. And, and there, there needs to be a continuity between the building of the business case and the execution of the, uh, of the, of the business case. That is, that is clearly a hard part. And I, I think there's a, there's a challenge there too, because the older supply chain finance programs are the asset backed lending where you'd leverage your receivable process were very much tied up in, you know, a monthly cycle to look to see what receivables were, what's under a certain uh, level or, or age to make those decisions. And it was very, I'll just call it human intensive. Uh, even there was a technology component to that was very heavily human intensive to set those plans and not not very dynamic or flexible, um, and thus it was relegated to some very large companies. Today, right, when we think about leading practices, these type of techniques can be used in many, many organizations, and that does require technology to help support, to help enable that. I was wondering if you could talk through some of the key elements about the role of technology. What are what are some of the, the important things someone should think about as they you know, plan to build their business case or as they think about moving forward with this type of program, you know, focused on technology? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. Uh, technology is a, is, a, is a key enabler uh, to make uh, the program a success because uh, if we just summarize the different steps we went through uh, during this conversation, Craig, we, we talked about the uh, working capital analysis so building the business business case. We talk about segmenting the suppliers and, you know, selling the programs to suppliers. So onboarding the suppliers from a, you know, marketing standpoint, but also from a, a KYC standpoint, especially when you have banks involved in those programs. Uh, and then there is the handling of the transactions because obviously uh, the transactions are based on, you know, invoices. Invoices come from ERPs and then uh, invoices need to be a clearly uh, displayed to the suppliers so that they can select which invoices they want to uh, accelerate. Banks are also involved. So there are different players uh, that are involved and everything needs to be uh, uh, really streamlined, especially because uh, there may be a lot of volumes. Um, also, because we're talking about payments and paying a supplier. So we know that we absolutely have to be careful and not to postpone the payment because it is a critical a payment for the buyer is a critical collection for the supplier so it can have a, a big impact if uh, if the early payment is not processed correctly and and last but not least a very important function that needs to be delivered by technology is uh, is the monitoring of the supplier financing program so through KPIs and reporting because the, the buyer needs to be in control and needs to know if it's going well if he has to readjust the actions if he has to change the communications towards suppliers and he needs to have the, the, the right KPIs to see if he's on track, you know, versus the business case that he has sold internally to the management. So technology in that sense is, is, uh, is clear because we're talking about suppliers, a lot of suppliers, about critical transactions, the payments, uh, about volumes, about different players that we need to connect, the ERPs, uh, the banks, the suppliers technology and especially cloud platforms can have a, a great role in making sure that the, the program is a success because go, going to going uh, quickly to, to the market is obviously um, uh, important for buyers suppliers and the funders yeah thanks for thanks for going over some of those key areas I, I, I like when you talk about the you know onboarding suppliers the power of the network means there's less work to do to get the majority of your suppliers to participate. Not everyone would take advantage of discounts if you offer just uh, 210 at 30. A certain number of companies can't process invoices within 10 days. Others may or may not choose to leverage that. So the idea of leveraging technology allows you to 
take advantage of the power of the network, but also hit more of your base, whether it's suppliers or buyers, you know, customers um, or suppliers. It gives you some flexibility. And then the idea of monitoring performance and focusing on KPIs. If you're relegated to adding these up on a manual basis, you won't have moment by moment or day by day statistics to see what's going on, how do I need to make changes in either, let's say, discounts I offer if someone wants to collect early. You know, you're able to, to be much more flexible and, and quick in that. Eddie, thank you so much for uh, talking with us on the different leading practices for payable financing and talking through a process of making sure we're looking at things comprehensively from a balance sheet and an income statement side and uh, you know, not focusing on one to the exclusion of the other. Thank you so much, Craig. It was a, it was a, a pleasure discussing these topics with you and uh, hopefully we can talk again on other topics. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.